So uh, this lecture today and the articles for this week are really focused around, in a lot of ways, space and how space relates to uh, resistance, relates to counterculture. Now, none of the articles that you're going to read are actually about geography or written by geographers per se. Though the work that I do on Palestinian hip hop is really, really centered around the specific spaces where Palestinian hip hop takes place, the show venues and stuff like that. But all of the articles that we have for this week are about music. There we go. Um, are about music, and a lot of them are really, really explicitly about the places where music takes place, where it's performed, where it's consumed. So. Uh, one scholarly approach to counterculture addresses this question of space, okay? And when you hear me talk about space or talk about spatial as an adjective, what I'm referring to is not simply a material measurement of space, right? Not, not simply like this is the space that this class takes place in, but also about ideas or imaginaries about space, systems of measuring space, um, and understanding of one's relationship to other people within and through space, right? In other words, space has a whole bunch of meanings that exceed the actual physical boundaries of it, right? So when you leave this space, right, you're going to carry with you a whole bunch of things and thoughts and ideas about what this space means, what it represents, why it's significant, and how we participate in it. And counterculture is really, really spatial. So Counterculture is spatial for a number of reasons. One, because a lot of countercultural work takes place in very, very specific places. In fact, a lot of countercultural work can only take place in specific places, right? Not, not only because it might be restricted, like if you're in a punk band, you can't just like roll up to the middle of University Boulevard, set up your band, and start playing there, right? They're going to shut you down. But also because there's certain cultural expectations about where certain things are going to take place. A punk show, logically, should be happening in a punk place, right, in a music venue. I would go to a punk show that takes place at The Rock or at 191 Tool, but I probably wouldn't go to a punk show if it was like in Hi-Fi or Union, right, because I'd be like, what kind of a freaking punk show would dare actually take place in Hi-Fi, right? Um, sorry, I know I'm just shitting on Hi-Fi, but it's so, it's so easy. I mean, it's just like, it's right there, so... Um, so while a gay bar, for example, might be an actual countercultural space, right, in which the physical buildup of the environment is extremely important to its operation, hip-hop culture, right, helps people communicate across space through a shared language, right? And a lot of this is going to be about hip-hop, and a lot of the readings, or one of the readings is about hip-hop. Hip-hop is really very geographical, really very spatial. It's very based in a particular urban experience. And it's very invested in geography and in geographic difference. Like, typically nowadays, a conversation about what sort of rap music you like oftentimes involves geographic signifiers. Like, I like Midwestern rap. Uh, I like Southern rap. I like East Coast hip hop. I like West Coast hip hop. Stuff like that, right? So again, what we're seeing is physical spaces, ideas about those physical spaces, imagined spaces that span large distances, and ideas about those imagined spaces. There's very many ways to understand the different spatial dynamics of cultural production, and I might hear say also, and cultural consumption. So I'm going to use hip hop as an example. So within hip hop, they, artists, might discuss the ways in which space is experienced oppressively, such as with rap songs that discuss gentrification or policing in their neighborhoods, right? So if you listen to any hip hop from any any place, right? You're going to hear a lot of geographical markers in the songs, right? Um, if you if you like listen, I don't know. If you listen to like War and G, right? If you listen to Regulate, right? If you listen to that song, there's a line that's about two one and Lewis. It's about twenty first and Lewis. It's an intersection in Long Beach, right? And for people who listen to that song who are from Long Beach, right? They can listen to that song and be like, I know that intersection, I'm connecting to this song. I'm sort of connecting to the people that are making this song through a shared sense of space, right? But also, if you're not from Long Beach and you don't know what the 21st and Lewis intersection looks like, you might imagine what it looks like based off of your own experience of similarly described neighborhoods, right? Or, you know, if I can continue to pull from my, my Long Beach music history, if you're a Sublime fan, right? 
Um, and if you've ever heard the song April 21st, 1992, do, do folks know that song? It's about the Rodney King riots that took place in 1992. So it's like, April 21st, 1992, there was a riot on the streets somewhere. Where were you? Yeah, you guys have listened to the song, right? So this whole song is all about geography, and it's always listing, right? It actually quotes specifically from the, the calls that police were getting into their telephone lines saying there's a robbery happening at, happening at this place. This place is being lit on fire, right? And you actually hear the real police recordings. And then I, I myself, once I moved to Long Beach, right, when I was younger, I actually went around to like all these locations to be like, where, like, where was this Vons that got broken into? Where was this music shop or liquor store that got lit on fire, right? So people might discuss very, very specific locations and the way in which they experience space in oppressive ways. And we can think about this in relation to gender very easily because if we think about the streets and the significance of the streets, what they represent, how they're experienced, that will be very, very different for men or for women, right? So if women were to rap about their experiences on the street, they might articulate some sort of um, frustration with the streets, some sort of anger about the streets being potentially a dangerous place, right? <coughs> Again, this articulation of a sense of oppression as experienced in very specific spaces, right? Now, you might also be using something like hip hop to create solidarity across space, such as, for example, through the uh, consumption of transnational feminist hip hop songs, which is what one of the articles for this week talks in depth about, right? So, for example, right, um, is, is there anybody who's involved in some sort of a cultural community, maybe a musical community, something like that, where if you were to meet somebody from another place, like totally on the opposite side of the US, but you were to find that they also did that thing, then immediately you two are like, like we're tight, you know what I mean? We're best, sorry, I don't know, I just went like naturally, that would be the handshake I would do with them, right? Does anybody participate in something like that, where if you just went somewhere else and you met someone who did it, yeah? Um, I was in drumline in high school, so when people find out if they've been in drumline, they're like, oh, that's so cool, do you guys pay attention to who did this? What was your favorite, whatever? Right? You're like best friends right yeah. away, right? Yeah. Exactly. Anybody else do that? Yeah? I'm in marching band. Okay. So, yeah, I get that. So you two should talk, right? <laughs> uh, yeah? Um, I did slam poetry for a bit. Okay. So, people did that and they were like, oh, that's so cool. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right? If you met someone from somewhere else, you'd be an instant connection right away, right? right? So, all of a sudden, space, right? Space, this thing that is supposed to divide people, ends up getting shrunken in so many ways by culture, right? And one's participation within a particular culture. Now, continuing this example of hip-hop, songs might be used to communicate some sort of notion of shared solidarity across space, right? So, for example, rap songs that discuss acts of oppression in other places than where they're being produced help produce solidarities across distance. Now, <coughs> it's important to keep in mind these spatial dynamics because they tell us a lot about the systems of oppression that the various artists who are producing cultural artifacts and the people that are consuming them come from. So this is, this is largely because relations of oppression establish avenues of resistance, right? There's this idea that a lot of people like to, like to float around that there is such a thing as a utopic space outside of systems of oppression. And that if we can go to that place, go to that space and access it, we can build, begin to build something new from there, right? On a scholarly level, we don't believe in such a thing, right? Most scholars don't believe there's such a thing as an outside of capitalism or an outside of racism or an outside of sexism, right? These are all encompassing systems that lay the context in which everything that we do that's social gains meaning and significance. There is no outside of capitalism. Uh, there is only an inside, and because of that, the way these systems work essentially establish our avenues for resistance. And we can continue to think about this with rap. So, to reiterate, countercultures oftentimes explicitly detail the ways in which their members experience oppression, right? On the other hand, every system of oppression, again, and we can think about this in terms of normativity, by designating things that are considered proper behavior, designates at the same time things that are considered improper. And in so doing, it invests those improper things with political potential, inasmuch as by using those things and accessing those improper things, 
you're able to challenge the system, right? So if, if when we define marriage as being between a man and a woman, we immediately set up the, the most obvious point of resistance to that very system, which is challenging the idea that marriage is just between a man and a woman. Again, we establish a system, and in so doing, it establishes the proper avenues of resistance to that system, right? So if you were to think about rap music, rap music is powerful, both because as a genre with musical conventions, it defies the music that's seen as proper, right, within kind of a Western or American context within the mainstream, and because it also explicitly details experiences of racial and class-based oppression, right? Can anybody tell me a country artist who has become super duper famous and is well renowned within liberal leftist progressive activist communities for their music? Yeah? I don't know, the Dixie Chicks? Okay, the Dixie Chicks. That's actually probably probably the, the most solid answer, right? The Dixie Chicks. So we struggled, right? We struggled to come up with that, right? And it's not because there aren't a ton of liberal country artists. There are, right? There's nothing that's stopping liberals from loving country. And anybody who says that they don't like country, frankly, just hasn't listened to enough country, right? Like, I definitely prefer more rap songs overall than I prefer country songs. But anybody who's like, I don't like country, it's like, y'all got to, like, listen to more country so you can find songs that you do like, right? But realistically, country has already been coded as American, as traditional, right? So because of that, the potential for somebody to use country as a mechanism to do these sorts of things is limited. It's not to say that it's impossible. It's certainly not, right? But what it is to say is that rap music, right, because of the fact that it's been so traditionally coded as improper, right, as rough, as offensive, right, as vulgar, Right? I mean, you know, you don't see parental advisory explicit content labels on country albums to the same degree that you see them on rap albums. If you go back historically to the early 90s, the Supreme Court, like the Supreme Court of the United States actually had multiple cases when they tried to suppress rap artists, specifically to live crews, ability to produce their music, right? And so the second the government comes in and says, hey, you rap artists can't produce this music, Right? Immediately that music becomes the very mechanism, right? a musical cultural mechanism to fight against the government. Yeah? I, I'm not sure if it's true, but I think it's really ironic for country music to be like, coded as the opposite of rap because historically it wasn't country, it didn't start with like um, African Americans trying to express themselves. You know, I actually have very, very little knowledge of the history of country music. So I, I wouldn't deign to, to venture an opinion lest it be taken as anything more than that. Um, but I know that pretty much the history of rock music in general, of which country is one subgenre in the United States, pulls largely from the history of African Americans producing music in the United States. Like if you think about rock, if you think about blues, like all these sorts of things, right? You you kind of you know even if you look at like a lot of like traditional songs like House of the Rising Sun by the Animals, right? Or a lot of these really famous like 50s and 60s songs. Most of them were written by black folk singers in the early 1900s and then like, re and then covered. But we know the covers that were done by like the white bands from the 50s and 60s. So, so yeah, but that, I mean, that's all I could venture on that subject. I don't, I don't really know specifically about country, but um, I certainly wouldn't be surprised based off of what I know about other musical genres. So, to think spatially again, right? These rap songs not only detailed an explicitly urban experience, right? So that when we think of rap music, we think of specific neighborhoods and specific cities and a specifically urban experience. But through their transmission, through their transmission over the radio, over the internet, they allowed communication, right? And solidarity and connection across large spaces, both in the US and globally. Now, physical spaces, if we want to think really generally, actual physical spaces and not just imagined connections across space um, are really important to counterculture. So we might think of different types of spaces like meeting spaces, performance spaces, or even community living spaces as being important to counterculture, right? If you think of the idea of like a socialist commune, right, the idea of a socialist commune is very critically tied 
to the sort of community living spaces that are invoked when we think of, of that idea. In other words, there's no way to imagine a commune outside of the physical location in which that takes place. And there's lots of roles of physical spaces within countercultural work. So one of them, which we're going to talk about, the two of them that we're going to talk about a lot later, is cultivating emotional closeness as being really critical to countercultural work, and then also fostering solidarity. But in addition, material physical spaces can help provide literal protection for different communities, okay? If we think about like domestic women's or d domestic abuse shelters for women, right? And can also provide material support. So they're very, very important and even critical, one might say. Even in a digital era when we're building networks across vast physical divides that don't necessarily involve specific physical meeting places, physical places are still really important, right? And establishing physical spaces for counterculture is difficult. We might say that getting a place to do something is half the battle or half the difficulty, right? You face zoning laws that might prohibit you from having a certain performance in a certain neighborhood. A friend of mine I found out recently lives in a city where they allow fast food places but don't allow drive throughs right? So, I mean, it would be like, you might say that there are, there are cities that allow for music venues to exist but don't allow music to go over a certain decibel level, right? There's also the cost of establishing physical spaces and really importantly, the threat. The second you have a physical space in which a particular marginalized community or cultural community starts to convene, that becomes a place that can then be targeted, right, by people who want to, to stop, uh, to stop that sort of countercultural work, right? And if we think about the history of any system of oppression, a lot of what we're looking at is the history of space, right? So if we think about the history of the oppression of women, there's so many spatial dimensions to that, right? Like women's exclusion from actual public spaces if they didn't have a male escort, right? And if we were to think about the history of, you know, black communities in the United States in the 1900s, right? We would understand that as, or, or throughout the 18 and 1900s, we would understand that as involving this large migration pattern from rural to more urban environments, right? And then also a history of spatial gentrification and other spatial policies that were targeted at and affected black communities, right? So we can think of a number of important moments in feminist and queer spatial history. And I wanted to highlight just a few of these. So the first one I wanted to highlight is the upstairs lounge arson attack. So this actually is an attack that predates a lot of, um, a lot of famous moments in LGBTQ history in the United States and was a case of, uh, of arson at, an upst at what was called the Upstairs Lounge, a gay bar in New Orleans in 1973. Last night, killing 29 people and injuring 15. What was done was done intentionally. It was arson. A lot of people I was real friends with died. It just doesn't seem right, I remember. The flames are just swirling. So all around me in the air, fire just ripped across the upstairs lounge. I ran to the window and miraculously got through the bars and then hit the ground. I saw the, the reverend's body hanging halfway out the window. And uh, the FBI found, found their bones and they don't talk to each other. My dad was murdered. The same as that. Many people whose family members died in the fire wouldn't claim the bodies of their family members. But I heard the comments that were made fact, queer. But the real big crime fire has been out of the church and politicians get fired. I think the police could have made more of an effort to find out who did it. Maybe because it was a gay bar. People just didn't care. It shows what can happen through hate. Somebody who was angry and full of hate, and they took it out on everybody. And I am. All them lines were snuffed out. Like a candle. Just, 
So now, here we're going to see a more positive account. Um, who's heard of that fire before? Right, one person. When you all think of LGBTQ history, which events are like the big turning moment events for you? Stonewall. Like I think for most people, probably Stonewall. Right. Now, who's heard of the riot at the Compton Cafeteria in the Tenderloin in San Francisco? Yeah. So, um, with Stonewall and with the Compton Cafeteria riots, one thing that we've seen over time is kind of like a really large uh, whitewashing of the history of these events, which mostly involved trans women of color and gender non-binary women of color um, fighting back against police uh, suppression in these, in these environments. So what you're going to see right now is a small clip from a documentary called Screaming Queens, the riot at Compton's cafeteria. Um, and it's actually produced by Susan Stryker, who's a faculty member here at the University of Arizona and is also considered one of the kind of uh, most you know, preeminent scholars on trans studies and trans history. So if you all will enjoy. They come down there to Ray Compton's to begin with. That's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. What happened then was the situation got a little bit out of hand. The document that launched my research in the first place said the fighting started when a policeman grabbed one of the queens and she threw her coffee in his face. Someone had thrown coffee in his face, and there was tables turned over. Compton's erupted. People started throwing everything they could get their hands on at the police. All the sugar shakers went through the windows and the glass doors. I think I put a sugar shaker through one of those windows. The hustlers kicked the police and punched them, and the drag queens beat them with their heavy purses. The cops retreated outside to call for backup. <coughs> cafeteria customers, maybe 60 in all, poured into the streets through the broken doors and windows and kept fighting as the paddy wagons pulled up. All those spike glasses windows here were broken out. And of course they had the paddy wagons and they were putting people in the paddy wagons as uh, they would come out and or start fighting. What happened? What did people do? Did they run around the out there? Just like all up and down the streets? Up and down the street, it was over here, aren't they? Before it was over, a police car was destroyed, the corner newsstand was set on fire, and years of pent-up resentment boiled out into the night. It was the first known instance of collective, militant, queer resistance to police harassment in United States history. And now, to bring things a bit more locally, who knows about the Women's Plaza of Honor? Like, let me see those hands up high. Who is unfamiliar with the Women's Plaza of Honor? H hasn't seen it, didn't know it existed, right? Which is totally, totally justifiable. So the Women's Plaza of Honor, if you're, if you're on University Boulevard and you're looking and you have Centennial Hall on your left and then the Art Museum Auxiliary on your right, the Women's Plaza of Honor is right between them. And you'll, you'll, you'll see it here in this video. Um, but this was a plaza that was established largely through financial support from, from our Gender and Women's Studies Department, but also with a lot of other community, community players. The Women's Plaza of Honor. This space represents the university. So like, just for the record, this was not filmed in 1987. This was actually filmed in like 2011, uh, in case you were confused. Uh, this commitment to the contributions of women of the world. Look around and you'll see plenty of evidence of the illustrious history of men on the University of Arizona campus. Just look at the buildings. <laughs> what? 99% of them are, have, if they have a name on them, have a man's name on them. Former University of Arizona Vice President for Research, Laurel Wilkening, figured it was about time for a change. She became part of a project led by the U of A Women's Studies Department to honor the achievements of women and to prove what she considered a campus eyesore. The big deal here is a way to honor women uh, who have contributed to civilizing of Arizona, either by being mothers or lawyers or what have you, 
and to uh, raise money for the women's studies program, and to beautify this part of the campus. Aside from the physical transformation, the university community celebrated a long list of firsts at Arizona's first university. This monument to women is a first at the University of Arizona. It's a first for the state of Arizona, and it's a first in the southwestern United States and probably even beyond there. This plaza emerges from the Women's Studies Department where it is such an honor to work. <coughs> this department is committed to unearthing and showcasing the legacies of women. Arizona Governor Jenna Napolitano joined the dedication festivities and pointed out another first. Arizona is the first state in the nation to have had three women governors. And we've had three women governors more than any state uh, in the country and I stand before you as the only woman in American history to succeed another woman as governor. Never happened before. Well, you know, the dedication for this plaza has been many years in the making. It's a wonderful space. Uh, it was a wonderful event to commemorate those who've gone before us, but also to make sure that future generations of, of women uh, know who, who did come before. The plaza gives physical recognition of women, but the initiative includes less tangible rewards. Fundraising continues to provide scholarships and advance research, as well as fund a plan recently approved by the Arizona Board of Regents to establish a doctoral program in women's studies at the U of A. Lofty goals for the future don't overshadow the present perfection of a peaceful spot in the shade. And I feel so fortunate to have a husband who loves, has loved me for 50 years and feels that he wanted to honor me in this way by giving a picture. And it makes me it makes me emotional, I'll tell you truthfully. The future holds bright beginnings for Arizona women. Today we can celebrate the achievements of those who preceded us, and while contemplating the past, revel in the present and a feeling of belonging. So if you haven't been before, the Women's Plaza of Honor is actually like I think a super nice little spot. It's a good place to sit down and do some research. And all over the plaza, they have different women's names carved into the stone who have been really important for uh, the history of women in Arizona. Did somebody already send around a sign-in sheet? Yeah? Yeah. She? Yes. Get it? Cool. Um, so if you go there, you'll see all these women's names all over the place. And you might be like, who the heck are all these women, right? But they have in there like a little computer kiosk stand that you can go to and you can look up any of the women whose names are in carved in stone there and read about their contributions to, uh, to women and women's communities and women's history in Arizona, right? So what all of these sorts of places, right, and their histories tell us is that there's spaces, right? There's just a bunch of spaces all over the way, place, right? But, but spaces become places, right? That sounds weird, but spaces become places through cultural acts, right? And these cultural acts can make spaces into places of significance for marginalized communities, right? So the upstairs lounge, if it had never been, had that arson attack and it closed in the 80s, right? No one would be talking about it. We wouldn't really know about it very much anymore, right? We wouldn't be able to use it as this marker of historical and ongoing oppression of LGBTQ communities and be able to rally around it, right? The same thing goes with the Compton Cafeteria riots, right? And the same thing goes with the Women's Plaza of Honor. The Women's Plaza of Honor is significant because of the cultural acts that have brought meaning to that place, and not just because of the actual physical construction of it, right? So one example, um, of how a space, a meaningless space, right, um, can become a specific historically significant place through cultural acts would be through co-opting of spaces, right? So if you think historically of sit-ins and what the purpose of a sit-in is and the very important choice of where to have a sit-in take place, the fact that they often take place in university administration buildings or in government buildings when senates and assemblies are in session, right, 
is, is, is not just a coincidence, right? It, it, it evidences a very, very intentional thinking through of the significance of space to power and the ability for countercultural movements to use spaces um, to, to help kind of foment resistance. So now, not only can spatial refer to the physical dimensions of space, which we've talked through at this point pretty extensively, it can also refer to ideas about spaces and their meanings, right? In other words, you can feel a sense of connection to a space or a connection to others through space without ever having been there or participated in that physical space. So spatial imaginaries, one of the key terms for this lecture, are networks of ideas that are attached to different spaces, oftentimes through cultural practices, right? So when you think of certain spaces or places, typically you conjure up ideas about those places, right? And in most cases, a lot of people, especially people from those places or who participate in those places, might oftentimes contest which ideas should attach to a particular place or space. So <coughs> who's from Phoenix? So what do people say about Tucson and Phoenix? Like, what are some of the things that people say? Because people in Phoenix think they know Tucson. And we do the same damn thing here. We think we know Phoenix. And I haven't spent more than like a couple days, total hours in Phoenix. I don't know anything about Phoenix. I haven't experienced all the cool stuff that's there. But like I still totally participate in like talking about Phoenix as though I know a damn thing about it. Like I'll always tell people like, yeah, we got everything in Tucson except IKEA. That's in Phoenix. And it's the only reason I go there. Right? You know, <laughs> stuff, stuff, stuff like that, right? Um, so what do people say about Tucson and Phoenix? Yeah. It's dirty. It's dirty. It is dirty here. I mean, it's like it's dust everywhere. Yeah, yeah. It's literally called the dirty tea. The dirty tea. Yeah, which I love. I love that nickname. Yeah. Are you from Phoenix? No. Or no. no. Okay. Other folks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what do we say about Phoenix here in Tucson? Who's from Tucson? Yeah, a few folks. What do we say about Phoenix? Super bougie, right? It doesn't have like a real sense of identity that really relates to being in the Southwest. Like you could take Phoenix and put it in any state anywhere, nothing really about the city would change. Going kind of hard right now. Ian's, crack, Ian's cracking up. He's like, "This is too real." No, no. I'm, 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 I come from Los Angeles, so everybody in Los Angeles always says like Phoenix is like die in Los Angeles. Like it's like you know, <laughs> L.A. light or something like that, which I don't stand because L.A. is just a total piece of trash, and, and Phoenix is actually kind of nice. Uh, yeah. Um, my family always says that Phoenix is so ugly. And I actually even hear people say, like, Phoenix is so flat, which cracks me up because it's like, yeah, we're more mountainous here in Tucson, but, like, have you ever been anywhere out, like, to the Midwest, like, where things are really, like, flat, flat, flat? Like, people come here and they look at, like, a mountain and they actually think it's a mountain, you know, but it's actually totally a hill. And, like, how wrong are we about all these ideas? Like, totally. What? So Phoenix is clearly better. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're like, so half of us are wrong. Right? But we're all, I, think, I don't know, I think we're all like totally wrong about these ideas, right? Like, because I've had friends that have taken me, taken me up to Phoenix, and they've taken me out for what was a really, really fantastic night, you know, and try as I might to find something to nitpick about or to complain about it, you know, it was just a fantastic time. Because you build the community you want where you live, right? And what about, what about with Tucson, right? Like, how totally wrong are people in Phoenix about Tucson, right? In terms of there being, like, stuff to do, you know? There's tons of stuff to do. If you're not 21, it might not feel like there's a lot to do. Like, I know house parties are kind of like the thing. It blows my mind that I can go out to drink on 4th and like never run into any of my students. I'm like, how does that even happen? But there is like this big divide, you know. So I think that a lot of people come to Tucson and it ends up being a, a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy that like you stay in this kind of university house party frat party bubble and then you don't, you don't go and do all these other sorts of things around the city, you know. And then, like, here in Tucson, we just think that Phoenix is just, like, Scottsdale, that, like, all of Phoenix is just Scottsdale, and then we've never been to, like, all these really cool neighborhoods in Phoenix, you know. So 
this is to illustrate that people totally make judgments about space and place, right? Because there's ideas about spaces and ideas about places that circulate, right? That people feel that they can capture and, and act upon, right? When we think of this, we, we can just think back to representation, right? Spaces are always represented, right? And spatial imaginaries are oftentimes about the contestation of those representations. So let's think about the University of Arizona. What are like some places at the U of A or near the U of A that have like meanings attached to them? Yeah? Right? Dirt Bragg. <laughs> I've never been in there before. But what, what, what's, what's significant about Dirt Bragg? So, so for folks that don't know, right, Dirt Bags is the bar that's next to the Taco Bell. And that's literally the best place for a Dirt Bags. It's like a perfect like metaphor for Dirt Bags. It's right next, right next to a Taco Bell, yeah. So, so what are the meanings of dirt bags? I'm already putting some of them out there because I've just heard nothing but horror stories about the place. I just feel like that's the place you go. Like once you turn 21, like that's where you go at night because everybody's always talking about it. Even if you go out during the day, you're like, hey, I'll see your bags tonight. Yeah. Right, and it's right there. And just so folks know, it wasn't that long ago that Dirt Bags was the only bar that was like really adjacent to the university campus, with the exception of like Gentle Bend. But like, no anchovies and and all those places are all relatively relatively new. Yeah. So, what sort of people go to no anchovies? If we're thinking about how one's participation in a physical space can generate ideas about that person through a spatial imaginary, like who goes to to Dirt Bags? Okay, so for other folks, who knows about dirt bags? What sort of stereotypes circulate about the people that go to dirt bags? Yeah? Um, well, at least when I grew up here and in the 80s, my dad was a student here, the, there was a frequent practice of like, discriminating against Mexicans in dirt bags. Okay. But now it's like better, but he's just like all friends. So, so, so that's, I, that's what I was looking for, right? There's this association that if you go to dirt bags, you're like, if you're a guy, you must be bro-ish, right? Like, you must be a bro, right? And if you're a girl, you must be into bros. I don't know, I don't know what the stereotype is for girls, right? I, I fully disagree, and I'm not trying to do this to endorse these stereotypes, right? But what ends up happening is people use these ideas about space, right, to literally make it so that simply having stepped foot in dirt bags characterizes you as a type of person. Right? And this is freaking ridiculous, you know what I mean? The same thing happens with the way people stereotype frats and sororities, right? Like anybody, anybody here in Greek life, right? And you guys get probably all the time people that just like assume, oh, since you're a sorority girl, like you must be this, 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 and this, right? You must think sorority boys are all, you, you, wanna, you wanna meet the biggest like critics of, soror of fraternity guys? Just talk to women in sororities, right? Like they'll, be, they'll have the most critical stuff to say, right? Um, but we think that, like, there's a stereotype that exists about, oh, well, if you would even, like, you know, enter into a frat party, right? So this ends up then getting connected to people who aren't even in the Greek system, right? That if you simply go to these sorts of spaces, right, this means something about it, which is ridiculous, right? Because spaces themselves are something that we use as a metric to be able to kind of work through identity and ideas of authenticity and cultural membership, right? So... To get back to counterculture, um, I was hoping somebody was going to pick on the dorms. Like, aren't there those two towers? Are those still stereotyped as being like the party dorms, or has that changed ever since those new apartment buildings were built? I have no idea. What is it? Yeah, Coronado, right? I was hoping someone was going to say Coronado because, again, like Coronado has all these sorts of associations with it. And you know that there's people that are just like, how the fuck did I get stuck here? I really got to study. This is bullshit, right? And so then somebody's like, oh, you live in Coronado. And, and she's, you know, this girl responds like, I'm taking 21 units. Like, it actually sucks. So, um, so coming back to counterculture, spatial imaginaries, not just physical spaces, but these ideas and meanings that are attached to space are really important for countercultural resistance. And this largely relates to the importance of solidarity for countercultural work. It's hard to iman imagine any sort of countercultural movement being successful if it wasn't able to generate senses of solidarity amongst its members and participants. Right? Solidarity is really important as well. 
because what, of what we learned in the last week, week and a half about intersectionality, right? Solidarity needs to be generated across a range of differences, right? But that's really hard to accomplish because a lot of times these in-group differences become, become you know, too big to work around, right? However, when you really feel a sense of solidarity with a group of people, that solidarity kind of over, kind of exceeds, right? overcomes any sort of sense of difference. So for countercultural movements, solidarity is an important <coughs> factor in success as excessive in-group disagreements can lead to an early demise for that culture. Has anyone ever come been involved in activism before or nonprofit work? Anything like that? Do you ever get like fatigued? Like tired out? Doing it? Yeah. yeah. Right? Like I, it was. It can be exhausting. I used to work, for years in my all my undergraduate time. I always worked in the nonprofit sector, and it was exhausting. Right, you'd come home after like you know this long day of work where you get to see all this sh terrible shit. You know, if you can imagine, like for social workers, and and it's like, how do you get up again the next day and do it right when you're so exhausted? But one of the things that keeps you going is the ability for that work to garner a sense of solidarity and connection to other people, a sense of family, a sense of communion, right? So it's really important for countercultures to be attentive to internal differences, right, that might cause problems and to navigate them in ways that promote solidarity. So being able to imagine a shared space, even across large distances, is one thing that can help people foster solidarity. So going back to earlier in the lecture, right, when I was talking about a bit more about hip hop, right, I, I mentioned that thinking spatially, these rap songs not only detailed an explicitly urban experience, but through their transmission, they allowed communication across large spaces in the US and globally. What this quote kind of indicates is that rap songs, by being able to generate a shared sense of urban space and urban experiences, we're able to generate through rap culture a sense of solidarity across these vast places, right? So that certain places like Chicago and New York and Atlanta and Los Angeles, right, and many other places become significant. And if you exist in those places, right, you feel that you're kind of connected to people in other places because of this articulated shared urban experience even across different spaces, right? And this is important because many of the practices that target marginalized populations, right? Thinking systemically, we're talking about institutional practices backed up by ideologies and made real through individual behaviors, right? That these practices target, target marginalized communities, oftentimes these practices are very spatial, right? Oftentimes separating communities physically, right, through practices like gentrification, deportation, incarceration, and others, right? So in that context, generating a sense of a shared, even if it is imagined space, is really, really critically important. So again, physical and imagined spaces are important for generating a sense of solidarity, but a lot of that has to do with affect. Now, before I get ahead of myself, I want to define this term affect. Has anyone heard this term before? It kind of comes out of psychology. You, oftentimes you hear people talk about emotions and affect or affect and emotions, right? So what affect refers to is the, the embodied reaction to stimuli impinging on it from the outside. Um, I geek out on affect because a lot of the work that I do is about affect theory and, and, and music affects and how the body literally like responds to beat patterns and stuff like that. Um, but affect is just a normal part of human existence. Every time anything happens, right? When I did that, like a lot of you looked up, you looked up, right? Because your body reacts in a certain way. Before your brain can even process that as surprise, articulate that you were surprised, the very first thing that happens is your body's reaction to it. So we are always living in a world where our body is constantly being affected, right? Not affected, but affected by the world around us, which is really important because our affects, right, how our bodies feel in response to the world around us is so critical to whether or not we are or are not going to do anything. So, for example, think about this, this expression that I've heard a lot over the past few years. It's just like feeling blah or feeling bleh. Has anybody felt blah before? Do you all know what I'm talking about? 
Isn't that a bullshit made up word? Right? Like, blah, what the fuck does that even mean? Right? But it works so well, it carries so much linguistic weight. Like, if somebody were to write me an email and be like, sorry, Professor Alex, like, I can't make it into class today, I'm just feeling blah, I would be like, yeah, I know, me too, but I have to be there. You know, like, I would totally get it. It's like, it makes sense to me. Blah is this affect. Right? And when we say blah, the reason blah is such a stupid word is because we just lazily try to pick words to describe this feeling, and blah just kind of makes sense, right? Because it's like a blah feeling, you know? And for some reason, blah just makes sense. Like, if I were to call it, like, it diddly doten boten, right? Like, you know, people would be like, no, I can't make it. I feel like diddly boten boten today. Like, people would be like, that doesn't feel the way you're trying to feel, right? Or it doesn't sound like what you're trying to describe, right? But blah is so important, right? Because if you just feel blah, you'll like pass on anything. Best friend's birthday, sorry, I can't make it. I'm feeling blah today, right? You know, it can, it can affect you so much. It can affect you so much. So if you don't feel like doing something, you're not going to do it, right? And this is cr this is just true. This is not, I'm going to this is going to be my one true blanket statement about about humanity. If you don't feel like doing something, you're not going to do it. Now don't get me wrong, your brain can convince your body to feel good about doing something. If she is indeed your best friend, your brain can be like, "All right, Heather, you got to rally like, you know, it's Tiffany, she's your bestie, right? Ride or die all the way to the end. You got to show up for her birthday." So you, you, you rally the energy, and the second you're there, you feel good about it. That law feeling has left, right? But if we don't feel like doing something, we're not going to do it. And that's so important to thinking back to this idea of solidarity, because our social world has already told us that we have all these in-group differences between us, and that these differences are important, and that these differences should be used to divide us, right? So in order to feel a sense of solidarity, and act on it, you have to feel good about it, right? You have to be involved in a culture that made you feel really good about being involved in that culture. And if you continue to have all these good, tingly affects in your body about participating somewhere, you're going to continue to do it, right? And that's the way solidarity works. So generating a sense of shared space can help generate a sense of emotional closeness to other people that allows you to just like feel a sense of solidarity, right? So does anybody, like to, to kind of riff on this again, does anybody come from like a background where if you meet somebody else from that background, it's just like, like your family? Anybody, anybody have this happen? Yeah? yeah. Oh, Can um, you talk about that? So I'm Somali. Okay. Yeah. In the UK or Canada or America. Right. It's like the, the duality of like your parents take immigrants and then you're raised in the West, but you're also Somali. It's like what? And is it just something that you verbally articulate or do you really feel it? Yeah, I feel it. Right, you feel I it. I can tell what they look like. I can always tell that someone's Somali just by looking at them. Okay, so now you're getting a little bit creepy? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Right? I totally feel you, right? Because this is the way it is with Palestinians, right? We're, we're all over the world. The diaspora has spread us out to all, all these different places. I have family, you know, in a dozen countries around the world because, you know, we've had to leave at different times. And, and, and I meet Palestinians in different places, and it's just like immediate sense of solidarity, right? And not just like, oh, I can articulate that you and I both have similar linguistic ideas about these political concepts that we have some sense of linguistically articulable shared history around. It is literally like, I feel this, you know what I mean? Like, I feel love, I feel emotional closeness, I feel connection. Yes, I trust you with my children, even though I just met you, right? Yes, it's totally okay that you root for the wrong for, you know, the Sun Devils in, in college basketball. I don't know, right? Um, also, you'll notice I did not talk about UA basketball today because I am not touching that clusterfuck at all. Like, I don't even know how to begin to unwrap that package. So I'm just not going to right now. Um, I actually have tickets to Thursday's game, and I'm like, what, what, what sign do I make? Um, so, I mean, they're taking 100 bucks from each of you every semester, right, for this new athletics fee. And they took that money from you, knowing that Rich Rod was, was you know, maintaining this environment of sexual harassment, knowing that Sean Miller might have been pulling this stuff behind the scenes, and not officially doing it, at least talking about potentially doing it. So, I mean, you know, like, they're taking 100 bucks from each of you every semester, and they justified that and sold us down the river on it at the time that this stuff was taking place. It, 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 it boggles my mind, but I digress anyway. I'm very frustrated about that whole situation. 
Uh, I'm more frustrated that we lost against Oregon really more than anything else, but, but still. So, so the sense of affect, right, is really, really important. You'll see through any sorts of differences because of this just felt sense of connection. And, and that's crazy, you know what I mean? When you really think about it, it's almost crazy to think that we have all these differences between us. But as long as we have this sort of cultivated sense of solidarity and emotional closeness through some sort of shared sense of space, right? If I'm using my example, the shared space of historic Palestine, maybe, maybe L with yours, it would be this, this kind of ideas about Somalia and about it as a place and the sense of shared historical connection, even though you live here now and, and maybe the people you're meeting, you're meeting here in the United States as well, right? So affect is really important to solidarity because in order for us to continue to work with people that come from different backgrounds and different communities, we need to feel a sense of connection to them, a sense of love, right? A sense of emotional closeness. Now, physical and imagined spaces become the staging grounds for cultivating this affective environment, right? The sense of being immersed within a cultural environment in which you're emotionally close to somebody else, necessarily necessary to be able to express solidarity. And music provides us with one way of thinking through that relationship. It's no coincidence that music cultures overlap with identitarian and political cultures because music is, is such a good mechanism for conveying ideas about solidarity and about shared experiences of oppression across disparate spaces, right? So what that means is that music has the ability to sustain solidarities with expressly political aims. And it's no coincidence that when you think about particular genres of music, they oftentimes conjure up emotional or affective ways of thinking, right? So what sort of emotions does punk capitalize on? Anger. Who agrees with that statement? Hands up if you agree that punk capitalizes on anger. What about rap? What? I, I agree. I mean, I'm a big rap person, so I don't like to pigeonhole it. But I'd say anger, too, right? Like, if you think historically about 90s rap and stuff like that, right? Because what rap artists and punk artists are doing is what they're saying is, hey, listen, you all who are listening, I had this experience. You probably had a similar experience. And I feel fucking angry about it. And I want to turn that anger into political activism. I want to capitalize on that anger and take that energy and use it right, for something. Where's that energy going to go? Anger can turn itself into sadness and depression, or it can turn itself into hopefulness, right, and a desire to change the things that are causing that anger. So rap and punk articulate a particular way to feel, right? They don't only articulate an experience of oppression, but they articulate a particular way of feeling about that oppression. You can have, like, like what about blues by contrast, right? Like, blues isn't all about, like, Hey, we can change things, like we're going to make things better, tomorrow's a new day, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, everything's going to be fine, right? Blues is definitely about capitalizing on sadness, on depression, right? And being able to generate a particular sense of emotional closeness between listeners using those emotions. Rap and punk instead are saying, hey, listen, like, this world's messed up, you must be angry about it, I'm anger, angry too. Hey, here's something we can all do with this anger. Let's keep feeling angry and let's use that, right, to generate something. And a lot of scholarship has been produced that explores this relationship between music, spaces, affect, and solidarity. So when you enter a music venue, you feel a certain way, right? Does anybody go to concerts? Maybe anybody in here go to electronic dance music places, raves? I don't know what they're calling them nowadays. Um, where, warehouse shows, I don't know. Um, right, so the second you walk into a venue, you immediately notice like the number of people, how close they are together, who's dancing, how many people are dancing, how are they dancing, what music is being played, right? And you immediately, like immediately process, all right, how am I gonna do this thing, right? Like I can, when I enter a place, I can almost tell you from the jump if I'm gonna be dancing or not, right? I've already made some of those decisions. So when you participate in these spatial dimensions, right, in these various things that, that make up the environment of a particular space. When you participate in these spatial dimensions in the music venue, venue such as through dance or other movements like foot tapping, right, um, eye contact, maybe singing, right, you can feel a connection to other people, right, in that space. Now, 
Entrainment. I love this concept. I use this a lot in my work, so I'm going to teach you all about it. Entrainment is this really cool thing. This refers to the uniquely human. It's never been demonstrated in other species. The uniquely human ability to recognize beat patterns and correspond their body movements to those patterns. Right? So if you're like... I'm not a big dancer. When I'm at a music venue, if there's a bar, I'm probably sitting at the bar. But I'm probably doing like a little bit of head bobbing, maybe a little bit of foot tapping, right? And, and if somebody else is over there and they're kind of head bobbing a bit, right? And I turn and they're bobbing and they turn and they're bobbing and we make eye contact, you know we're going to be like, yeah, uh -huh, you're feeling what I'm feeling, right? Like I, and I know that their body feels kind of maybe a little bit similar to my body, and I feel a sense of connection to them, right? And you know what? Even if they do support ASU basketball, I'm still going to have a good time with them that night, right? We're still going to dance together. And this is what entrainment is, right? Entrainment is that if we go into a venue, right, and everybody's dancing around us, we are able to pick up on how they're dancing, the way they're responding to these beats, and then kind of in train with them, we're able to sink in with them. And that sinking provides a sense of closeness, right? So when you like go to a really good rave, right, and you're there and you're dancing, you, you don't even need to be touching other people. You just feel an immediate sense of closeness, right? As though what you've generated in that moment together is something really unique and special. It's not. Um, no, I'm kidding, right? But, but, but you feel this, and it feels very, very weird, right? And then you'd be surprised the things that you'd be willing to do for these people because of your sense of emotional closeness to them that's been generated in that sort of space, right? So dance becomes a way of entraining with other people, a way of building a sense of connection and a sense of solidarity with them, a sense of emotional closeness, which can be really useful, especially if we're thinking about things like rap or like punk, right? In other words, places that are prefigurative, places that are the cultural staging grounds for potential political movements in the future. So and, uh, this, this was all, this whole lecture was intended to kind of introduce this idea of space and to preface a little bit of what's going to be talked about in the readings for this week. So we have three readings, and again, um, when we get to class on Thursday, we're going to be doing a short little uh, reading quiz for participation points. It's not going to be about specific figures or facts. It's going to be about key terms and key ideas. I'm not even going to be asking you to regurgitate the names of the authors, but make sure you're paying close idea to the close attention to the main ideas of these pieces. So the first one is this piece, Everyone's Given Up and Just Wants to Go Dancing, which is actually a quote from an interview that the author had done. And the author is Neil Nearing, and Nearing takes a close look at what he terms anti-rockism. Um, and this article is, is being written in Britain, by the way, which is a growing ideology that repudiates the belief that rock, especially punk rock, has any transformative potential. So anti-rockism is this idea that, oh, you still love rock, you still think punk rock's going to change the world, you're an idiot, like, get it together, live in the real world. Like, this is anti-rockism. And anti-rockism, Nearing locates anti-rockism as an ideology in a particular moment in academia called postmodernism. Okay. And even after Nearing sorts through this entire growth of anti-rockism as an ideology in the 80s and the 90s, he still concludes that rock retains really transformative potential. So as you're reading this article, make sure you're asking yourself, well, what political elements infused, influenced punk rock music and how in the article, especially during the, the Margaret Thatcher era in Britain? You're going to want to look at how Nearing connects dance, or connects punk music. Sorry, I miswrote this. Um, punk music to politics in Britain. What role does gender play in Nearing's article? There's a few moments where Nearing talks about gender explicitly, though they're small. And then finally, where do you see affect, as defined in this lecture, appear? Or what feelings do people use music to express, explore, or relieve? The next article is The Growth and Disruption of a Free Space. This article deals with the punk scene, but not with music per se. Instead, it surveys literature on the free space movement, focusing specifically in the article on the do-it-yourself or DIY culture within the punk scene in Long Island. So the authors use disagreements in the free space movement. The free space movement is a movement that was used to co-opt and utilize physical spaces um, for cultural work. Um, so you, they, the authors use disagreements in the movement to examine the limitations and contradictions within the movement itself. And they don't dismiss of the importance of such spaces, 
so much as they examine the impossibility of a perfect solidarity and the difficult but important work that's involved in managing different views within a cultural movement. For this article, you want to be answering these questions. And with these questions also, it, it's fair to think that some of these might, might appear potentially on the quiz on Thursday. So first off, what defines a free space according to the literature? What was the disagreement in this punk space or DIY space and how was it resolved? What role did space have in building solidarity? And how did the space present its own challenges? Now, for the first two articles, we're dealing largely with physical spaces, actual physical spaces. But the third article, We Either Move or Petrified by Lauren Gardner, deals more with imagined spaces across transnational circuits, right? So between countries. This article provides a literature review of scholarship on transnational hip hop feminisms, as well as three case studies to illustrate the author's points. This is the article that's a bit dense and difficult to, to deal with, but we're gonna be watching a movie on Thursday that, that uh, kind of foregrounds one of the, one of the groups in this, in this article. So it surveys not only music and dance, but also graffiti as well, because hip hop as a culture has multiple pillars, including DJing or turntabling, emceeing, uh, b-boying and graffiti, in other words, like the physical, audible, spoken, and visual aspects to hip-hop culture. Um, Gardner criticizes some common themes in transnational hip-hop feminisms, specifically the presence of dichotomies of us and them, or self and other, while at the same time suggesting alternatives to these dichotomies or these approaches. And Gardner pays particular attention to the transformative potential of transnational hip-hop feminisms and their ability to build a sense of solidarity across space. So with this article, make sure you're paying particular attention to the self-other dichotomy and why it's important. Also, what is significant about the three case studies for feminists. And finally, how do transnational hip-hop feminisms build a connection? This is supposed to be across vast spaces, all right? So, um, that's it for today. If you have any questions, come see me after class. Um, if you came late and you haven't gotten your paper back, I have it here. Again, Thursday, we have a reading reflection due. I'll have more info on the midterm, and we'll have a short, not punitive reading quiz. And if anybody didn't sign the sign-in sheet, it's up here. <laughs>